So thanks for the invitation, really, for putting together this amazing um, event. I think it's really unique. And also thank you for giving me this spot in the program. Uh, I mean, um, I would probably, must confess, I would probably change all my slides right now to align my talk better with the first one, but I cannot, so we'll uh, leave what I have uh, with what I have. But you'll see a lot of um, um, points of contact, let's see, between the two words. All right, and let me start talking about art, not about science, for just one or two minutes. And uh, I want you to think about uh, the most famous piece of art in the world, really the first thing that pops into your mind. Okay, I'm sure that most of you have thought about the Mona Lisa. And indeed, this is the most famous, uh, the most well-known, even the most parodied piece of art in the world. But probably um, a few centuries uh, ago, um, Leonardo, and no art historian, would have predicted what uh, happens every day at the Louvre. If you've been there, um, you know what I'm talking about, right? You have experienced all the elbowing and all the crowds to have just a quick glimpse of this very um, small painting. What many don't know is that uh, the Mona Lisa was not always so famous. It became famous after it got stolen. It took three days to realize that the painting had disappeared. <laughs> and um, after the theft, um, a big debate happened, uh, started between Italy and France on where uh, the painting was, should be returned. At the end, it was returned to the Louvre. And because of this, of all of this um, uh, media coverage, of all this discussion, people started going and, um, and visiting the Louvre to see the, the, the painting, which had must have been of uh, outstanding quality to receive so much attention. So this, this story, highlights the difference of what I call uh, performance and success. Performance is um, the, the painting of Leonardo. Uh, success um, are uh, represented by the crowds that every day get, gather at the Louvre. So in other words, performance is um, an individual property. It's about you. It's, a painting, it's a work, it belongs to the individual. Instead, success um, is about us. It's a collective phenomenon. It's a uh, reflection of what we think about performance. And why is this important? This is important because we work often under the assumption that if we do something good, automatically we are going to be successful. So that really performance and success are strongly related. But uh, there is important research that shows that this connection is not trivial at all. Uh, just to mention one, um, many, a few important words, the work of um, Dodds, um, Sarganic, and Watts um, about the relation between performance and success in music. They show that, yes, there are some correlations, uh, but in controlled experiments, you really can uh, see that um, even um, songs with the same quality can take two very different um, popularity success trajectories. So performance and success um, are different, are different many uh, realms, also in science. And here, I will focus first on success, on how we think, how we model success. And then I will go back and uh, give some uh, thoughts and some evidence on uh, the relation between performance and success um, in science. So, but first, um, what I will do is um, uh, talking about how success, actually how impact evolves in a career. Just one second. So I would need the second screen to work too. Hello? Okay. <laughs> well, let's improvise on this. Okay. Um, 
So the questions that I'm going to tackle um, are uh, who is going to have uh, an outstanding achievement within a career and when? And to tackle these questions, I will use a strongly data-driven, um, a strong data-driven approach. So I'll use uh, two uh, data sets uh, that are very different um, in nature. So these are publication data sets. And the first one is provided by the American Physical Society. It's a data set of uh, about half a million papers, um, 3,000 careers, and it's very highly longitudinal. So it spans over 110 years, but it's focused on one discipline and on the citations uh, within the discipline. The other data set, um, it's, it comes from a combination of Web of Science and Google Scholar data. Um, it contains six fields. Um, there are many more papers and more careers, but um, uh, all the papers are uh, predominantly published in the last 30 years. So um, the, uh, let's say the time focus and discipline focus is different between the two data sets, but all the results that I show you are qualitatively uh, the same, which reassure us about the robustness of what I'm going to show you and about the universal features of the laws that I'm um, presenting to you. So with this data, what we do is constructing um, um, scientific careers. What do I mean by career? It's something like this. Uh, so this is the career of Richard uh, Feynman. Uh, on the x-axis, I will put time. And each red dot here uh, represents one paper of Richard Feynman. Um, and time corresponds to the publication date of that paper. And the height of the dot, it's a measure of the impact of that paper here captured by citations accumulated in 10 years. We can use other proxies uh, of impact uh, results um, do not change. And we can spot immediately, in the case of Feynman, uh, the highest impact paper. I will call this the heat or, uh, yeah, the, high, the, the outstanding achievement of Feynman. And we are interested in reproducing the properties of statistical properties of the um, heat of all scientists. I will call the time when a, a heat is published T star and the magnitude C star, so the, the magnitude um, of the impact of the best work of a scientist. So um, this is just another way to represent um, the career. It's exactly the same, just move it out. All scientists in the data sets, in the data set, in all the data sets um, have outstanding achievements. So we started looking at the properties of uh, these papers. And when we do that, this is what happens. All these careers look different with valleys and peaks of impact. To identify outstanding discoveries, the team focused on the highest impact publication by each scientist, shown here by the red dots. The data showed that scientists tend to make major discoveries when they are young. This finding matches previous research on creativity. For example, the first line here represents a career of 23 years. This scientist published his breakout paper in year five. The second line represents a 14-year career with the highest impact work published in the first year. But when the team examined the reason behind early creative success, they stumbled across something that surprised them. Scientists are simply more productive when they are young, giving them a higher chance of producing that big hit in their early years. If we ignore the timing and only look at the position of the highest impact paper in the sequence of a scientist's publications, we see that the highest impact paper can be with the same probability anywhere in the sequence of papers published. It could be the first publication, it could appear mid-career, or it could be a scientist's last work. In other words, impact is randomly distributed within a scientist's body of work, regardless of discipline. A result the team named the random impact rule. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what happens often in science is that we give names uh, twice to the same thing. I discover, we discovered later that a uh, similar phenomenon was already found in the work of uh, Dean Simonton. So the random impact rule is pretty very, very similar to the equal odds rule. 
uh, but let me stick with the um, term ran random impact rules. So um, in other ways, if we look at the distribution of uh, the timing of the highest impact paper, um, we will find that this distribution is higher in the first 20 years of a career. So here, um, this star is, the, again, the, the time of the best impact paper. And we put the frequency of uh, scientists having their uh, highest impact paper in the first year, in the second year, and so on. You see that this uh, frequency is higher um, on a plateau, more or less, for the first 20 years, and then declines. But the question is, what did we expect? What was our expectation a priori before plotting this? So this is where we realized that we needed um, um, a null model. And a null model is constructed by taking careers, like the one that I showed before, and destroying the impact time correlations. So what we do is keeping the dots where they are on the x-axis and just reshuffle the y-axis, so reshuffle the impact. So in this case, the highest impact paper could happen to be random with the first, the second, or the last one. If you do this multiple times for multiple scientists, so you have a new synthetic um, data, data set and do exactly the same measurement as we did before, this is what happens, that there is no difference, almost no difference between the data and the randomized data. So it means that um, so by keeping only productivity and forgetting about impact, we could have predicted the, the, the curve that we got, so the, this distribution. So, and don't take the shape of this distribution too literally, uh, because if we change the way we select our data, if we change the way we segment the data, um, uh, we obtain different shapes. Uh, but what uh, never changes is the uh, lack of differences between data uh, and randomized sample. All right, so this means that the hit is random in a uh, scientist sequence of publications. And just wanted to give you some anecdotal evidence that this is true. Um, Frank Wilczek, he uh, won the Nobel Prize for work he did during his PhD. Uh, and actually, uh, for work he published in, the very in his very first paper in his career. Uh, John Piffan won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry uh, for work that he published after he retired and he moved from uh, Yale to Virginia Tech. So basically, there is always hope <laughs> <laughs> if you keep publishing, if uh, there is sustained productivity, all right? So impact is random within a career, but we do know that there are you know, systematic differences in impact uh, between careers. Um, and uh, we want to capture the, um, the systematic differences between careers. So um, the first, sorry. Uh, you'll see that uh, the blue guy here uh, systematically low, uh, scores lower than the orange guy there, although uh, impact is randomly distributed within a career. So a model that captures these differences um, is a model where impact it can be decomposed with in two variables. One variable uh, called P um, that we can identify with luck, and we will see uh, in a second why. And one variable called Q, which is associated with the researcher. So um, in this uh, model, basically, um, a high Q and a low Q modulate um, the impact, modulate how high you can score. So if we generate the same, the exact same uh, sequence of random numbers for these two guys, we would reproduce uh, two uh, careers uh, that have basically up and downs at the same place, just um, trivially, I would say, this guy scores higher. So um, with a different Q, the same um, uh, lack variable, we can have a much higher impact. So um, this was just to give you an intuition. One can formalize it better. Uh, we can see that there are uh, actually three variables at P, P, Q, and productivity. And one can measure the um, cross uh, correlation between all these variables. The important part comes here. When you measure the cross correlation, you'll see that the um, correlation between P 
and individual variables like Q and productivity N are basically zero, which allows us to decouple P and Q and call P really a, a lack variable because that's the same distribution for all the scientists uh, in the data set. So this distribution is unique, and based on that, we can do a series of prediction that we can then validate with the data. So this allows us to actually validate the model. So for example, if we take the distribution of impact, it's very different for scientists with different Q, but if we renormalize impact based on Q, they all collapse on the same curve with very small fluctuations. So this confirms that uh, distribution of P is unique and can be interpreted as slack. The second prediction, the Q parameter is stable throughout the career. We can measure that. So Q for 80% of the scientists does not change a lot throughout the career. So it's pretty stable. Uh, there are um, a number of predictions that you can do with, uh, with the model. Um, these are all testable, so they allow us to validate the model. Um, you can predict, for example, all, um, almost all impact indicators, like cumulative number of citations. I won't go into the details. I just want to say that really um, this model can reproduce the stochastic process uh, behind the impact in a career. Later, um, about two years later, with, uh, together with Ashun Wang, who is somewhere in the audience, so he's participating in the, um, in the meeting, um, and Lu, Liu, um, they spearheaded an effort where uh, we uh, studied the random ink through also in other uh, realms, like artists and um, with movies, we movie directors. And we saw that the random impact rule is true, not just for the highest impact paper, but also for the second, for the third, and so on. So it's pretty general, and this is all good. But when we look at the timing between this best, uh, highest impact paper, second one, and so on, that timing is not random at all. So um, basically what happens in a career is that um, you have a moment when uh, impact becomes higher. We call that moment hot streak and contains the highest impact works of a scientist. How do we reconcile that with the random impact rule? The hot streak can occur any time within a career. So the first, the second, the third uh, highest impact paper work is random, just um, uh, their timing, uh, the timing within them is not random. And one can construct a model based on this, which actually is even more accurate than the one that I showed you before. So going back to my questions, who is going to have an outstanding achievement? This is a lucky scientist with high Q and went randomly within a, within a career. And I have to say, highest impact paper cannot be the result of luck alone or high Q alone. Really, you need to have both variables uh, to, um, to come together. Um, so we created, so the, the video that I showed you, the extracts is online in case you're interested to, to look at the whole one. And we also, we have um, an interactive visualization where you can really um, play or explore the careers, the impact of the careers uh, interactively. And that is the website. So remember, I was talking about performance and success um, and how they are different. And we have some evidence that in science differ. I will provide evidence of this and, and think, and also share, if I have time, thoughts about the fact that we are still have a long way to go to make this um, um, really solid. And I think this is where uh, efforts of the science of science or meta science community should go. And um, I will talk uh, first about um, performance and success in interdisciplinarity in interdisciplinary research. Uh, so we got inspired by this paper uh, published by um, Australian researchers on, um, in nature, where they showed that uh, grant proposals that are highly uh, interdisciplinary, so this is on the x-axis, have a lower chance to be funded. So the chance of uh, be funded um, the, um, uh, declines with interdisciplinarity of the project. This is, uh, was done with grants uh, in Australia. And we asked, what about awards? Uh, so not about research that needs to be done, but research that has been done already. How do we recognize that? And we looked at uh, 
probably the, one of the or the most important award in science, so the Nobel Prize. When you look at uh, papers associated with the Nobel Prize and look at their patterns of citations, we have um, many different versions of what, ha what can happen uh, with impact from the community. So we have cases like uh, the 2000 paper, so it got uh, the um, uh, prize in physiology. And most of the citations of this paper come from the life sciences. We have also papers like the one by Dan Schechtman, uh, discovery, um, he discovered the quasi-crystals. Um, the paper was published in physics. The Nobel Prize was given to him uh, in chemistry, but most of the citations come from physics, a little bit from uh, chemistry and a lot um, uh, from engineering too. So it's very interdisciplinary impact what he got. We have also cases, sorry. Oh, there is one slide missing, no. Okay, we have uh, cases um, uh, of prizes where uh, the prize has been given in chemistry, but all the citations come from uh, life sciences. So imagine a situation like this, but where the prize was given in chemistry. So um, what we did was systematically studying impact for all the Nobel Prize um, discoveries for which we could associate um, a paper. And uh, we looked at the impact of these discoveries and placed them in a triangle. So if you have a paper that was cited only from chemistry, you will find it in this um, uh, bottom corner, so the corner associated with chemistry. If a paper got all its citations from the life sciences, it would be there. And if a paper got all the citations from physics, it would be there. If a paper gets citations from chemistry and physics in equal amount normalized by the field, it would be on that axis. And if a paper gets all citations, uh, citations from um, all the three fields would be exactly in the center of the, paper, of the triangle. Um, the size of this dot uh, tells me the citations, the number of citations that actually the paper got. So the bigger, the more citations. And the color tells me um, the prize uh, that, uh, that the discovery was awarded with. So yellow is physics, uh, sorry, yellow is chemistry, blue is life sciences, orange is physics. All right, so these are the three papers um, that I showed you, well, the two papers that I showed you in the previous slide, plus one. So this is the discovery of Schechtman. It got um, a bit of interdisciplinary impact, so this is why it's between chemistry and physics. And the other two discoveries, they all got impact in the life sciences, although were awarded with two different prizes in life sciences and physics. If we look at all the papers that we uh, could put in our data set, you'll find something interesting. So you see that most of the physics um, um, Nobel, uh, so the, all, most of the papers that were awarded with the physics Nobel Prize are in that corner. Um, all the life sciences are in that corner, while the chemistry ones are scattered around these uh, two axes. So this is the first observation. Second, second observation, there is nothing in the axis life sciences <laughs> physics. And even most remarkably, uh, there is nothing in that shed area, shaded area in between. But one could say perhaps there is no research that, is, um, that has this interdisciplinary impact that is actually there. So what we did uh, was then to take um, the top 10,000 papers for citations in Web of Science and putting them uh, in the same triangle. And it's true um, that most of the papers are in these two uh, bands where uh, the chemistry uh, papers, uh, the chemistry Nobel papers were placed, but we have also something in the middle. And what is that? We have here works on artificial intelligence, network science, geology, signal processing, quantum dots. So it seems there is a bias um, against uh, interdisciplinary research when awarding, when giving recognition for the Nobel Prize. And uh, the Nobel Prize was born disciplinary, right? So one could say, just leave it alone. It's um, the 
how uh, it was designed. Well, I have here my personal opinion. Um, the rules of the Nobel Prize were already changed over time, so I think we could bend those rules further if we wanted to. But I think the most important opinion is um, that we need to create a world, or we need to rephrase existing world in a way that it's, uh, we accommodate the best science, even interdisciplinary science, if, um, if that is that merits, and not just uh, pigeonhole um, awards within disciplines. So, and this is true for the Nobel Prize, which is um, become probably the most representative prize uh, in, for good science, but also for the other ones. Nevertheless, we have an informed way uh, to do. Uh, to take decisions um, by looking at this systematic um, uh, impact, so systematic ways of uh, how we assign uh, recognition. All right, and the second example where there is, um, well, we have some evidence that there is a difference between performance and impact uh, recognition in science is when we look at the role uh, of chaperones in publishing. So this project started a bit with a, with a joke, if you want, with my colleagues. Uh, we were saying, uh, do you need to publish in nature in order to publish in nature? Now, it seems circular, but the idea is, do you need to publish with someone and introduce you to the system, to how the editorial process works and nature, to select the relevant question, to have higher chances later to become a principal investigator on a paper uh, published uh, in a journal? I took here the nature example, but we did a study uh, for um, about um, 500 different journals, so all the results uh, are valid for uh, one number of journals. And um, we studied um, the proportion of principal investigators on a paper. Principal investigators can be of three kinds. They can be new, they have never published in a journal before. Principal investigator can be established if they have already published uh, as principal investigator in that journal. This is the case of uh, Weissing, who is twice a principal investigator on Nature. Or they can be chaperoned. These are people that publish as principal investigators and have published as, um, in the journal before. Leimar published in the second paper as non-principal investigator and then became a principal investigator. So um, all people, all principal investigators in a journal, um, on a paper, sorry, they need to belong to one of these three categories. So they sum to one. When we look at the relative proportion between these categories, we find that there is shocking uh, result when it comes to new principal investigator, the number is declining. You see it uh, after the year 2000, it's declining, and it's not only it's true not only for nature but for many journals. So we have less and less new principal investigator in a journal, although overall in the world and the number of uh, scientists is increasing. And when we look at um, proportion between chaperon and new principal investigators, and we call this chaperon phenomenon, we see that different disciplines have a different um, uh, magnitude for the chaperon phenomenon. So in mathematics, it's almost non-existent. Uh, it's this chaperon phenomenon, the role of chaperons uh, becomes more and more important uh, with look physics and so on. It's the most important in interdisciplinary science. And one could say, okay, whatever, you're chaperoned or you're not chaperoned, what matters is the um, recognition of the scientific um, um, audience of the, of the colleagues. So what we asked is whether new chaperone established papers receive different levels of recognition. And we quantified this with the average impact that the paper gets in the first five years. Now, our initial hypothesis was that papers authored by new PIs should have higher impact because of the lower chances to be published or to go through the editorial um, process in the first place. So they must have really important um, uh, reported discoveries. And instead, what we found is the opposite, that um, 
uh, established and chaperoned papers have a twice or three times higher impact than uh, than, shop, uh, than sorry the new uh, PI papers. Uh, there might be f many explanations about this. One could say that uh, established and chaperoned uh, papers are more able to um, select a relevant question for the audience of the journal, um, or it could be that it, there is just more reputation involved. So we cannot really untangle the phenomena, or the, sorry, the explanation here. But we might have some evidence, again, that there is um, a divergence between quality of research and success. And in this case, the success um, depends also on the reputation of a mentor, of, a, of an author in the team. OK, so I want to conclude with some thoughts. So uh, performance and success in science in many fields are different. But we are obsessed with success. So most of our proxies of performance are actually proxies of success. So we use success to, um, to gauge performance. And there is a reason why we do that. Success is um, measurable. It's much easier to quantify than performance. Performance is very hard to quantify. But I think we have the moral duty to understand better the connection between performance and success if we continue to use success as a proxy on performance. Um, and I understand that in our society, we need to quantify things. So we will continue to uh, start to, to use uh, measures of success. But really, um, it's important that we start thinking of ways to find the right connection with quality performance and so on. So it takes a village. So all uh, the research that I presented and more projects have wonderful collaborators. Um, and as I mentioned for Dashun, one of them is here. So also have a chat with him if you're interested in seeing the things I presented. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. Really fascinating. So in um, uh, psychology, uh, they've looked at hot streaks in uh, athletes. And uh, the, the argument has been that uh, the, is sort of the fallacy of the hot hand. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm wondering uh, if you have any explanations for why you see uh, hot streaks in uh, art uh, and science. Uh, and, and if there's any reason why you, you, you find it there, and you, the, the claim has been that you don't find it in uh, athletics. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's a $1 million question. Um, I think with this approach, we cannot say why it's there. And this is why we need interdisciplinary collaboration with psychologists and so on to understand better the origins of that. What we can say is that it's there. So one can perform a lot of controls to see that that is statistically solid, that, it's, that there are not confounding factors. But on the why is there, why some scientists have a high Q, what really is Q? Um, unfortunately, I think we cannot, with this approach, we cannot give an answer to it. Do you have any theories? <sighs> Not specifically in the hot streak. I have more theories about the Q factor, which is related, by the way. I think that there are, again, a combination of factors. So there is not one single explanation. There are many explanations that come together. And if we look at them singularly, we will never find the smoking gun that says, oh, this is the reason. Uh, and this is why um, I think we have not much insight right now because it's the combination of many factors. So um, I think that high Q comes, for example, from having systematically good collaborators. It could be that you choose, you are able to put together a team that is systematically good. It's also uh, like ability, the ability of presenting results. Uh, it's uh, definitely the institution you are affiliated with. So it's a number of things. And it's taken singularly, we don't have an explanation for that, so we have to put everything together, and they have a multiplicative effect, probably. Thank you. Thank you.
Uh, so uh, thank you very much mm -hmm. for your thought-provoking talk. I, I mean, I have a comment on your wonderful analogy uh, with the Mona Lisa, mm -hmm. because I think it introduces a, an unnecessary confusion, because it implicitly equates success and popularity. Mm -hmm. as it happened with Mona Lisa. Mm -hmm. And this uh, e e e equating success and popularity goes throughout your talk, even though when you analyze specific cases, you do go to success, uh, true success in sciences, uh, making discoveries that are confirmed and validated. So I think it's, uh, it's, a, psycholog I mean, it's psychological or social part. Uh, and to me, it's basically, it's a, it's a marker that this, tendency to equate success and popularity mm -hmm. permeates our thinking in a way that we even don't recognize it, as, as I think is happening in, in, in this presentation. And I think it needs to be subtracted mm -hmm. and somehow separated because I think this is the key. Yeah. And it obviously relates to, the, to using citations as a, as, a, as a proxy for success. Yeah, so I uh, understand, um, understand the comment and I... I mean, I agree with that. I agree that popularity, fame, success, they are all different things, but they have one thing in common that are social effects. So they are different from quality, from performance. And this is where I step in, if you want, as a, as a physicist, where um, I, I study um, um, collective phenomena. So they have some... Uh, uh, the methods that we can use to uh, study success are the same methods that we can use to study the popularity and so on. Then when we look at success versus popularity, I agree that there might be difference, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, but what matters is that they are collective, they are social phenomena, while performance is not. Does it make sense? Uh, we'll talk later. But okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. Hi. Um, yeah. I actually have a similar question. First, mm -hmm. I want to say beautiful talk, and it's really fascinating, Thanks. and I appreciate your sharing it with us. Thank you. Um, what I'd really like to hear a little bit more about is what you consider to be the broader impacts of this work. Mm -hmm. So um, in, what, in some ways, those of us sitting in this audience may think, now the only thing that my work is good for is if I have my highest citation count publication. Like, mm -hmm. is that what we should all be striving for, is just to get the best, most highest cited count mm -hmm. and to get a Nobel Prize? Or is there something, <laughs> Okay. like, no, is there I, still, can you talk a little bit more about the broader impact sure, of where you think sure, that this sure. uh, No, no, so um, actually it started with the difference between performance and success for this reason. This research is not, in no way, um, um, doesn't want to uh, tell people, oh, wait for your big hit, or this is how you should have your big hit, or um, this is uh, how you can have more than 100 citations and so on. It's, it's not about that. I think all scientists, we are a bit primed uh, with this uh, narrative, but it's not uh, that. Here, I wanted to um, provide a model of how citations um, go up and down, and, and we did that, and actually that has um, important implications of how we can normalize indicators to remove uh, productivity factors, lack factors, and so on. Um, so if you want, it's a way to better um, analyze and control data, but Personally, my personal agenda, um, my personal research agenda, I really want to understand how that, whether impact uh, equates or what, what is the relation between impact and quality in science. We know almost nothing about that. So we can tame success, we can model it, we can normalize it, we can predict it, but we have no idea how that is related to quality. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the implications, um, many of the implications come to um, allow us to do uh, predictions and to interpret better predictions uh, of success. And I'm happy to discuss more about that. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I guess that when I'm thinking broader impact, I'm thinking, how are we helping the world? Maybe. Or is this is the way we're helping the world is helping us understand how to be more successful, or that we're now have a better way to model data, or something else in between? Okay, so if um, and this happens actually a lot in Europe, if we say um, 
we should take the H index or another measure of cumulative number of citations and give some score to it to evaluate grant proposals. With this kind of analysis and modeling, we can say, hey, wait a second, you are uh, mixing uh, apples and oranges, you cannot do that. The way you should do that is this one. And we can remove the uh, productivity factors, impact factors. We can study, for example, if the distribution of Q is different among populations uh, of scientists. For example, it's different between uh, female and male uh, scientists. So we need some uh, conversion factors and so on. So if that is the um, what uh, funding agencies, for example, want to do, then this research allows us to give more informed decisions. Now, what I'm questioning is that the, the, the choice to take the each index or um, um, impact-based measures to uh, gauge uh, scientific quality. And this is where I'm bringing uh, my research right now. Yeah? <laughs> sure. I have Sorry. a question. So in your model of Lucky and Research Q, is Research Q a constant? Uh, the Q of, for a scientist is taken to be constant, and it's um, uh, and we can check this constant for eighty percent of the scientists. Okay. So there are twenty percent that where the fluctuations cannot be explained by simple um, statistical fluctuations. Yeah. So, but I'm wondering, is the researcher Q can increasing like a lot during the years? Is that possible? So. Uh, for most of the scientists, for 80%, it doesn't increase or doesn't decrease systematically, all right? So that it's uh, for 80% of the scientists. In the hot streak paper, we saw that there can be a temporary increase of the impact that would somehow increase also the Q and then decreases again to the same level. So it extends the approximation done by the first model. Okay, thank you. Sure. Um, very nice presentation. On the first half, I would like to ask you a question about the possible implications of your work. So I think as a field, uh, meta-science study, even though it hasn't always had that name, has tended to focus on those who have made great achievements. And mm -hmm. it seems quite logical that if you want more great achievements, you should look at what the people who have made great achievements are doing and try to do more of that. But if within the context of the people who are, are doing good science, the great achievements are fundamentally lucky within that context then by focusing on those who have made the greatest achievements and juxtaposing what they're doing to those who have not, is there a fallacy there? We're biasing ourselves to look for a phenomenon that basically doesn't exist. Uh, Peter Agre won the Nobel Prize in 2003 for discovering aquaporins. Mm -hmm. He was trying to find what the RHD antigen was. There was a, a band that happened to be co-purifying on his gel. He was curious about what it was because it was always there. So he sequenced it and it turned out to be this really important gene product. Hundreds, thousands maybe of scientists have done the same thing, me included, sequenced the other band and it turned out to be an irrelevant thing of no known function and just, you know, nobody cares. So is the field making an error by focusing on, on the greats and the logical positives did it, Feyerabend did it, Kuhn did it, the anthropologists in laboratory life do it. They study just the big achievements and ignore the denominator of the fraction. Mm -hmm. So if your findings about randomness are, about luck in that context are quite correct, would you agree with that possible implication that the whole field may be a little bit misguided at looking at focusing myopically on great achievements. Yeah. Um, I think I've never said that we should somehow give some advantage to high Q scientists or to um, people that have high impact. What I wanted to do here is showing that we can model and we can explain high impact in a mechanistic way with mechanistic rules. Now, I really, I really want to stress here, never said that um, research with uh, lower impact is less important or less, um, shouldn't have less attention than research with high impact. And, and actually, um, yeah, so one of the, I would say, novel elements of the, um, the, sh the work that I showed you is that we analyze all scientists, all of, all, all of those present in the data set, all the papers and so on, and the model works for everybody. Now, what decisions we should take based on this? It's, yeah. 
accurate. I'm asking your opinion yeah. on the implications of that mm -hmm. as far as how we analyze the methodologies of, of scientists. Is it an error? Have, has the field made an error by focusing myopically on achievement? Yeah, so what I think is we should realize that there is a luck component in all we do, and we should understand if that luck component is, um, um, is predominant in respect to whatever Q means. And, and we should really um, make sure that we don't... Um, we, we don't give, for example, an early advantage to scientists that happen to be lucky at the beginning of their career uh, because something could happen um, later. Um, and I do think that, nevertheless, even if uh, we say, okay, whatever, we believe that there is um, um, uh, more ordinary science, or ordinary science and extraordinary science, I think everything is uh, an, an ecosystem. We do need incremental discoveries, so or we need the, the frogs talking, uh, uh, like uh, Dyson did, right? We need the frogs and we need the, the eagles, the birds in research. It's an ecosystem. And if we, let's say, give an advantage to one of the two, we don't know what happens to the entire scientific process. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you for the wonderful talk. Uh, so my um, question is where, on the graph where you show that uh, uh, the new PIs, the uh, number or frequency of uh, new PIs uh, in a particular journal on the, on, on the field is decreasing over time. Yeah. Uh, I wonder what would happen if you would control for the number of authors yeah. uh, in, in, the, in a particular journal or, or on yeah. the field. Yeah, so I didn't go into that because of time. So there is all a set of controls that we did. Um, um, so yeah, specifically on um, uh, team size because uh, the typical team size in a discipline between disciplines can change a lot. So in mathematics, there are mainly solo authors, and uh, in other disciplines, there are um, uh, big authorships. So we control for that, and um, and the effect is still uh, present. And the way we can control for that is selecting, for example, taking just a subset of the papers uh, across different disciplines with similar. Uh, authorship size and measure on that subset um, uh, our, do a, take our measurement on that subset and we still see uh, the same uh, proportion, basically similar proportion. Thank you. Yeah. I'm afraid this will have to be the last question. Go ahead. Neat. Um, so I wanted to ask about, so if we have your model where luck and Q account for productivity or not productivity, but rather mm -hmm. for uh, citation impact. How does this fit with, so there's this tradition of talking about a Matthew effect in science, where yeah. scientists who have citations get more citations, where scientists who are famous become mm -hmm. more famous. Mm -hmm. Does this data push against the importance of that effect, importance of that effect, or no. is Q kind of, could that include other factors like popularity or, yeah. Okay, so the Matthew effect and this model are com perfectly compatible. So the Matthew effect says rich gets richer and it's, um, um, mathematically wise, it's um, uh, a term that we put plug in a, in a probability. And it's true, for example, um, at the paper level, how papers acquire citations. The more citations you have, the more likely you are to get. Mm -hmm. That's great. Here, we take a more static picture. It's true that I look at impact over time, but for each paper, we take the number of citations uh, in the first 10 years. So from that uh, point of view, so that uh, we can rule out, we can put out the Matthew uh, effect out of the, of the system. So, um, so the two are compatible. Uh, but, but the scientists no. themselves, their Q isn't getting higher over time because some sort of... No, because effect. we use impact over 10 years for each paper, mm -hmm. it's basically, even if there is a um, Matthew effect, that inflates the citations of all papers in the same way, more or less. Okay. So, this can be explained easily, so they are compatible. It's just um, how we think about, so the fact that here we have to discretize the system um, uh, requires that we aggregate over time at the paper level so we don't have 
material effect anymore. So, uh, yeah, but it's a very important point, actually, one of the points of the referee, actually, or one of the referees. So, yeah. Okay. Thank you.